sweet gunmetal day when the giant bear lord came roving near our home. To me, born was just salvage at first. I didn't know what born would mean to us. I couldn't know that he would change everything. Born was not much to look at that first time, dark purple and about the size of my fist, clinging to Mord's fur like a half-closed sea anemone. I found him only because, beacon-like, he strobed green across the purple every half minute or so. Come close, I could smell the brine rising in a wave, and for a moment there was no ruined city around me, no search for food and water. Instead, for a dangerous moment, this thing I'd found was from the tidal pools of my youth before I'd come to the city. I could smell the pressed flower twist of the salt and feel the wind, knew the chill of the water rippling over my feet, the gruff sound of my father's voice, the upward lilt of my mother's, the honey warmth of the sand as I looked toward the horizon, if I had ever lived on an island, if that had ever been true. Around me, Maud's body rose and fell with the tremors of his breathing, and I bent at the knees to keep my balance, and there was born defenseless. Names of people of places meant so little, and so we had stopped burdening others by seeking them. The map of the old horizon was like being haunted by a grotesque fairy tale, something that when voiced came out not as words but as sounds in the aftermath of an atrocity. Anonymity amongst all the wreckage of the earth, this is what I sought, and a good pair of boots for when it got cold, and an old tin of soup half hidden in rubble. These things became blissful. How could names have power next to that? Yet still, I took him in, and I named him Born. Hello, New York. <laughs> that was the opening. Yes, that's just appropriate to clap for New York. Um, <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was the opening of my new novel, Born, which I'll return to uh, in a moment. Um, usually at this time, too, I have a rousing shout out from you all of I blame Vandermeer uh, for my various sins, but I think there's uh, plenty of other people to blame by this point, so we'll skip that. As for thank yous, thanks to The Strand, uh, a bookstore that I have admired and loved for a very long time uh, and have snuck into in many prior decades, hoping beyond hope to one day see my book featured there. Um, and so it's been kind of a dream come true the, few, uh, the last few years, especially with the Southern Reach, uh, to see how, how warmly received it's been by The Strand uh, and now Born. And I'd like to thank, in general, uh, indie bookstores. Uh, we've been on the, book, the Born book tour. F we were on the Born book tour for like five or six weeks before we took a short break and then came up here. And we visited so many revitalized, vitalized, amazing indie bookstores, all with their own character. Um, and it was just wonderful to see so many books that are also so optimistic about the future. Um, so it's really important to support your, your indie bookstores, and, and I want to thank them again. I'd also like to thank my wife, Ann Vandermeer, if she will stand for a second. Um, She uh, has been uh, with me on what has often been a carnival sideshow behind the scenes. For some reason, people have been giving me a lot of stuffed animals, um, a lot of, lot of bears. At one point, I was just taking a rucksack of stuffed animals with me everywhere I went. Um, and for not killing me yet, I really appreciate that. Uh, for uh, 43 straight days, she did not kill me. I, I, that, that feels like some kind, of, uh, some kind of record. And also thanks to Eric Bogosian, uh, such an iconic and multi-talented creative person for being here tonight. Uh, I took a chance because uh, on my blog uh, after the Southern Reach came out there was a, a comment that was, I thought, from Eric Bogosian. Uh, and so then I reached out on Twitter to, to, uh, to ask if Eric was interested in, in joining me for this event and then had this moment of panic that maybe it wasn't the same Eric Bogosian <laughs> <laughs> and maybe someone else would show up and, uh, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but thank you, Eric. Um, so getting back to Bourne, uh, you, you may have heard that there's a giant uh, flying bear in Bourne uh, that terrorizes uh, the city that uh, the character Rachel lives in, uh, and little interfering foxes, and of course the character Bourne, who Rachel salvages and who begins to grow and grow and eventually to speak. And Rachel just can't give him up for various reasons. Even though her boyfriend Wick wants to break Bourne down into parts for his biotech creations, she's become attached. And especially so in the aftermath of an attack on the Balcony Cliffs, the place where she lives, when she's beaten up and Bourne drives away the attackers. So while she's recovering, she begins to teach Bourne something of the world, and that is the section uh, that I'm going to read for you tonight, followed by the interrogation um, and the general Q&A.
Born made me happy, but happiness never made anyone less stupid. During my recovery, I had such trouble remembering what waited for me outside as if I had to learn it all over again despite having been taught so many lessons. All kinds of dangerous ideas entered my head while groggy. It was as if the little foxes and other animals out in the desert ran in circles around my mind, barking and kicking up dust, stopping only to stare at me from afar. I kept fantasizing that I lived in a real apartment in one of the stable sanctuaries from my past. Everything would be fine. I just had the flu or a cold and was out sick until I got better. And when I was better, what would I do? When I was better, I would go back to university into some part-time job. I would complete my studies so I could become a writer. Because the ruined city was just a bad dream and my life as a scavenger was a bad dream. And soon I would wake up. But minds find ways to protect themselves, build fortifications, and some of those walls become traps. Even as I started to walk around my rooms with Bourne, even as I ventured out into the corridors, it was so sad a fantasy that I brushed by without recognition the revenants that told me it was a lie. Yet those weeks also contained some of my best memories because of Bourne. Wick was gone a lot, spying on his rivals, which left Bourne and me ever more time to explore. He'd gotten tired of being cooped up in the apartment. On days when I knew Wick would be out for hours, I'd take Bourne into the hallways, prickly with the fear of discovery and stiff from my slow healing wounds. It was all a construct by then, this game of not telling Wick that Bourne could talk. He had to know, but because I never admitted it and Wick never brought it up, Bourne became an open secret that existed between us like a monster all its own. It made me reckless as if I wanted Wick to confront me that somehow our relationship would be a total lie if Wick didn't confront me. Ignoring the strain on my body, Bourne and I would race down dim-lit corridors, Bourne afraid of colliding, congealing with the wall and tripping over his own pseudopods, wailing as he laughed, you're going too fast, or why is this fun? <laughs> Which just made me laugh too. When you don't have to run and you have the chance to run for the hell of it, it becomes a strange luxury. Then we'd collapse at the end of the hall, and Bourne, in addition to his usual observation that he was hungry and needed a snack, would ask some of his questions. He never stopped asking them as if he were really ravenous for the answers. This dust is so dry. Why is dust so dry? Doesn't it need some wet for balance? Then it's mud. What's mud? Wet dirt. I haven't seen mud yet. No, you haven't. Not yet. I would show Bourne a photo of a weasel in an old encyclopedia, and he'd point with an extended tentacle and say, Ooh, long mouse which brought me quickly to the idea of teaching Bourne to read, except he picked that up on his own. When we played hide and seek, I'd sometimes find him hunched up on the edge of a midden of discarded books, two tentacles extending out from his sides to hold a book, and a single tentacle tipped with light curling down from the top of his head. He would study any number of topics and had no real preferences, his many eyes enthusiastically moving back and forth as he read the pages at a steady clip. I don't believe he needed light or eyes to read, but I know he liked to mimic what he saw me doing. Perhaps even thought it was polite to seem to need light, to seem to need eyes. But the truth is, I don't really know what he thought or how he thought it, because most of the time, I just had his questions. Eventually, I took him to Wick's swimming pool, which was Wick's laboratory. I loved the swimming pool, and perhaps that meant I lived, loved Wick too, in a way. It could take a while to get used to the melange of chemicals which gave off a dank smell cut through with something spicy. Wick needed the light in the window in the mornings to feed the rich, revolting, shimmering brew to finish his beetles and other creations. Eel-like things wriggled in the mire and the fins of weird fish broke the surface, only to submerge again. What's a swimming pool, Bourne asked, a place people go into to swim? But it's full of disgusting things. Disgusting things live in there. Just disgusting, really disgusting. Disgusting was a word Born had just picked up and used often. Well, just leave those disgusting things alone, Born, even if you are hungry. Born summarized for me. A swimming pool is a place where people like to swim in disgusting things. <laughs> Close enough, I said. You won't be encountering any of those when you're out in the real world. And then I wished I hadn't said it, because I'd acknowledged that this wasn't the real world, that we lived in a bubble of space and time that just couldn't, wouldn't last. I took him to the balcony out on the cliffs, too, but that was a little harder, because I felt Bourne needed a disguise to be safe. I found a flower hat with just one bullet hole, 
and a brown blood stain to match. I found a pair of large designer sunglasses. I had the choice of putting him in a blue sheet or a black evening dress that I'd salvaged from a half-buried apartment. The evening dress was moth-eaten and had faded to a deep gray, but I chose it because I had nowhere to wear it, and it was several sizes too big for me now. So Bourne reconfigured himself to be a little longer and less wide than usual, sucked in his stomach, more or less, and put on this ridiculous outfit. But it wasn't complete enough for him. What about shoes, he asked me, and I regretted having gone off on a rant about the value of a good pair of shoes a couple of days before. You don't need shoes. No one will see your feet. Probably no one would see him, period. Everyone wears shoes, he said, quoting me. Simply everyone. You even wear them to bed. It was true. I'd never gotten over having to sleep in the open so often. When you slept in the open in dangerous places, you never took off your shoes. Bourne really wanted shoes. He wanted the full ensemble. So I gave him shoes. I gave him my one extra pair, which were really boots, the ones I'd come to the city in. He made a great show of growing foot legs and with his hand arms reached down to put on his new shoes. From the aperture at the top of his head, muffled by the hat, came the words, we can go now. But if Bourne wanted the full ensemble, I wanted the full human. Not until you grow a mouth, I said, and a real face. Uh-oh, he said, because he'd forgotten. In those days, he always said, uh-oh, when he felt he'd made a mistake. Maybe he was also trying to be a little difficult, a concept he'd been field testing, usually in charming ways. The transformation only took a second. All of his eyes went away, and then two popped up where appropriate, and a nose protrusion that looked more like the head of the lizard he had eaten a few hours earlier, and a kind of crazy grinning mouth in that hat, in the black evening dress, in the boots. He looked so earnest that I wanted to hug him. I never for a second understood the gift I'd given Bourne. We went out onto the balcony. Bourne pretended he couldn't see through his sunglasses and took them off. His new mouth formed a genuinely surprised O. Oh. It's beautiful, he exclaimed. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Another new word. The killing thing. The thing I could never get over is that it was beautiful. It was so incredibly beautiful, and I'd never seen that before. In the strange, dark sea blue of late afternoon, the river below splashing in lavender and gold against the rock islands, the river looked amazing. The balcony cliffs in that light took on a luminous, deep color that was almost black but not, almost blue but not, the jutting shadows solid and cool. Bourne didn't know it was all deadly, poisonous, truly disgusting. Maybe it wasn't to him. Maybe he could have swum in that river and come out unscathed. Maybe, too, I realized right then, in that moment, that I'd begun to love him. Because he didn't see the world like I saw the world. He didn't see the traps. Because he made me rethink even simple words like disgusting or beautiful. That was the moment I knew I decided to trade my safety for something else. That was the moment. And no matter what happened next, I had crossed over into another place. And the question wasn't who I should trust, but who should trust me. Thank you. And, <laughs> thank you. And now we will, we will attempt a smooth uh, transition to the in conversation. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Bogosian, and uh, it's a really great honor to be here tonight with, thank you, um, with Jeff. Uh, like, I, like he mentioned, I actually was in a bookstore. I saw Annihilation. I saw the cover, and I just liked the cover so much, I bought the book. And uh, uh, I, I read it and I was like, this is terrific. I got to read more of these because the, it's a trilogy. And it just got better and better. It got harder, it, 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 uh, but it got better and better. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm a fan. And now I've read Born and I, and I actually, I didn't expect that we were going to be doing this. So I had sort of, I had Born and I was going to savor it at some point this summer. And then I, I, I just finished reading it. First of all, I just want to say that you reading your work out loud just supports even further my sense of you as a really terrific writer in that you 
uh, it just sounds so great. It just, it, the, the, all the, the language is just flows beautifully and you clearly have such a great sense of that. Uh, while while um, reading the book over the last few days, I couldn't stop thinking about the book as other things were happening in the world around me. So first of all, my wife and I have been watching Anne with an E, which is Anne of Green Gables, <laughs> Another Orphan. Um, and I kept getting Rachel confused with Anne in the, between the two. I was like reading the book and watching the show. Then, um, then there's the news, again repeated today, that the NSA has created weaponry that's so t atrocious that it's, it's shutting down entire countries because it leaked out. And that's an important part of Bourne is that the company has made these horrible weapons that have gone awry. And, and there's just generally this feeling that there is this construct that, that is hurting us and is, is polluting and hurting the world we live in. And then finally, another favorite TV show of ours is the um, Great British Bake Off. Uh, <laughs> and, um, we were rooting for these different bakers, and I don't know if you watch a show or not, but you know, they all have different levels of skill, and there was this one woman, we just finished watching it last night, and there's this one woman who wins, and we were kind of rooting for her, and the reason why, and I realize that this is really an important part of being creative, is that she takes big chances, and isn't afraid of being awkward, and doing something that is gonna put her you know, maybe it's not going to work. And, and, and that, watching that tightrope act of a really highly skilled artist in combination with taking these big chances is, I feel, what it's all about. And I really feel you've done this with both these books, which um, I really commend you on them. Um, and I hope everybody here reads them all. So I'm going to just start with a, a topic. Uh, anybody who's familiar with area will know what I'm talking about imme immediately, uh, or I guess that's not the right word for it. What am I supposed to call it? The uh, what? Area X or yeah, area yeah, X. Area X. Southern Reach. You can Southern call it whatever Reach. you like. Southern Reach trilogy. <laughs> the the Great Bake Off uh, area. I, I am going to ask a question. <laughs> the great, I'm going to ask a question, and the question is: it, it's the topic of maps because mapping is such an important part of both of these books, and I do now have a sense. I kind of suspect, I guess I kind of knew reading the, the trilogy that this was taking place roughly where you live. Yeah. Yeah. Down in Tallahassee. Yeah. Uh, but when you make, when you do this mapping, how much mapping, like you obviously have to know a lot more about it than we do. So are you creating detailed maps for yourself when you're this and also in Bourne, there's a city? Well, in, uh, for Area X, um, in some ways, it's very crude. I have a very crude like map on my wall that's just like to give me an idea, to, to remind me of where approximately certain things are that I need to that I'm referencing a lot. So it's not really a map; it's like a ghost of a map. Um, and then there's the actual Florida coastline, which I actually had a graphic designer remap with those things on it so that I would have it. Then there's the map of what Area X is actually doing, you know, creating doppelgangers and all of this stuff. And I need to have the map in my head of, of uh, what the logic is behind that, even if none of the characters actually ever find out what that logic is. Um, then there's the question of what on the map is visible and what isn't, because one thing that fascinates me is the fact that we sometimes passively re receive maps as if they're the objective truth about things, and yet they're always coming from some agenda, whether it's a political agenda or whatever else, as to what they show, what they emphasize, what they don't emphasize. And I always keep that in my head, and sometimes I keep that in my head when I'm thinking about maps of characters um, and what they would know or what they wouldn't know. Um, so I don't have uh, like detailed maps written out, but I, I do think about these issues, and I think about the the interesting thing about about what you need to give the reader in terms of a map, especially when you're dealing with really ambiguous stuff, so that they're not lost. But then there's things that you that you don't want on that map for them because it's actually it's actually more interesting for the narrative. Um, so it's definitely something that's on my mind. There's a, lot. a vibe with um, Area X that feels a little bit like mist 
or something like that. <laughs> you got towers, you got things going down. Well, you, it, people it, are always having to go to. This the, is the, a part the, of your psychology. You may not even know that the, you, you return to this again. <laughs> return to is, this. Is, ge, you know, topologies that yeah. the, the protagonist has to go into, and it's kind of scary well, going in there. I think what that reflects is that Mist did a really good job of showing you what it's like to be alone in a landscape with nothing in it that's another human. <laughs> <laughs> they actually do a really good job of capturing, like, you know, when I go hiking out uh, to the lighthouse at St. Mark's, I can't help but be reminded of something like Mist because it does such a good job of capturing that. Um, but yes, there's the, you, you're kind of trapped between these objects and these objectives. Um, and, uh, and you do have to, you have a decision-making process that I suppose is, is, is like some video games, but then that's just basic cause and effect to some degree. Um, and in the and one thing that about the movie that actually still kind of still jars in my brain is they've put the tower tunnel under the lighthouse, um, and so one of those decision making uh, arrows is gone, right? Because they're just going right to the lighthouse rather than do we go down to the tunnel tower or do we go to the lighthouse, um, which I find to be personally, at least for fiction, to be a more interesting um, set of conundrums, so to speak. But. And then there's that weird swamp in between that's yeah. kind of... Which is real. The, the weird swamp. I mean, the, the thing about the weird swamp is I've been out there and I swear that from the corner of my eye I've seen like a really huge black kangaroo. Um, <laughs> and then I've looked again and it's, I, there's nothing there, so I cannot confirm that there's a giant kangaroo out in North Florida. But, but you see strange things. The, the, the mind tries to create images the map to something known out of stuff that you see out there. And it is a very strange, strange kind of unmappable place in some ways. So that brings me to the other mapping that has to happen, which is, well, in the, in the case of Area X, there's so many unknowns that you can't really, that's part of the thrill of reading the book, is trying to grip onto things that you can't quite grasp. But in the story of, in Born, the history of the company, the history of this place, the actual city, what everything's doing, and particularly, and uh, I think in the realm of, uh, and I don't know a lot about fantasy, I mean, I, I did myself by going back to like William Gibson or something, that's when I stopped reading. He's all still this around. Stuff. But um, <laughs> you have a lot of biotech fighting other biotech, things are all, and you have to know like what kills what, right? It's, it's kind of like um, Pokemon. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's like rabid Pokemon. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, you have it, to really know like how much poison will yeah. get, what, particularly with Born, because Born right. has strengths, but there's, is not invulnerable. Well, I, I think that, um, a, a lot of that is oddly instinctual because of growing up with an entomologist, research chemist father who, who kind of like, uh, you know, was always getting stung by insects of some kind or another. That's probably why there's a lot of beetles and ants and other things in the book. And um, uh, I, I think it's really that, um, you know, in, in, in Annihilation, the characters have no names, <laughs> and the vegetation seems to be more named than the characters. And in this book, I, what I wanted is I wanted to have the anonymity, for some reason, of the city, the company, and then have all this animal life in the foreground and the, and the characters in the foreground in a way that they're not in, a, in, a, in Annihilation. And um, uh, I don't know, a lot of it's in instinctual. I had a lot of fun with the fact that I am creating science fantasy as opposed to science fiction in the sense that I believe that if you write about characters who are living in a future that's lived in where they're at the street level, so to speak, they're not going to spend a, 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 lot, a lot of time explaining or even understanding what it is that they're seeing. So it's going to be slightly fantastical, just like you wouldn't be particularly happy if you opened a mainstream literary novel that's set in the present day and there were five pages of description of how a smartphone is put together and works, right? Because you just use it. <laughs> um, and so it was more, it was, it was, um, I don't know, a lot of the, the, the combinations there are just kind of instinctual. That part just kind of came to me. I guess that means well, my brain's kind of whacked out because uh, well, there's some crazy ass stuff in there, I must admit. Well, I don't know about whacked out. I mean, you, you, you're, you're hanging on to a lot of, I mean, for me, reading it from the perspective of a, a writer, and I have written fiction, that uh, you're operating on many levels at the same time. And one, 
I guess some writers, when they know that they, they go, this is what the plot's going to be. I have it all figured out ahead of time, and I'm just going to fill in all the parts. Um, my first book was like that. I knew that there was going to be a <clears throat> crazed gunman is going to go to the shopping mall and start shooting place up. I know he's going to die by the end of it. So all I have to, I'm more interested in the, the all the that's stories I'm going to hang on. Right? Yeah, it's all the yeah. right. Exactly. That Make gives a you the pinwheel the, narrative. That gives you the, yeah, that gives you the structure to do whatever you want, basically. Right. But other people, I mean, another way to go is the headlights down the road mm -hmm. thing, where I don't, I'm going to let the thing keep building as I'm writing it. I don't know where this is going, but as long as I'm honest with it. You have a story that starts with, but you also are deeply thematic. So you keep everything that's propelling the story forward has to do with Rachel's urge to connect to another person, as well as born reciprocating. So did you have this all plotted out before you started, or did you like find it as you went along? Um, there's this, this, this it, it's just weird how it occurs. It usually occurs that I have a, a character with some kind of charged image, and everything kind of like pans out from that. Uh, and then by the time that I know what the ending of the story is, then I can begin to write it, even if the ending changes. In this case, I had this image of this woman reaching out to what I knew was actually some sentient, like sea anemone-like creature. And then I had this, the shock and surprise of realizing it was in the matted fur of a bear. And then literally in that vision moment, like I, th I think I was hiking, um, the bear flew away. So I had to ask myself, am I going to leave that in? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought of a book by Angela Carter called Knights of the Circus, uh, where there's a flying woman in a circus, and she never, never gives you a clue as to whether the woman actually flies or not. And I thought, I'm no Angela Carter, but I like the idea of actually dealing with this enigmatic thing. But, but, but really what happened is it's like, I said, wh I said why is she atta attracted to this? Okay, it reminds her of something from her past. Oh, it reminds her that she grew of when she actually lived on this island nation, which is now gone. So immediately there was story there. The immediately there was a past. Um, and then it just kind of, and why is the bear there? Oh, the bear is the product of this company. Oh, there's a company? Okay. And, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And so it just kind of organically grew like that. And you just let it grow in your mind like that, at least I do. Um, until you reach this kind of saturation point where you know it's time to write. Um, and for me, there's never a sell-by date on that moment to write, but there is a, a, an early moment when if I start to write too early. And part of that was realizing that the core relationship was be the development of Bourne and, and Rachel, um, that relationship. And then I realized that um, there were elements of my relationship with my stepdaughter when I first entered that family and she was seven or eight years old and the conversations we had. And then I took a step back because I, th I thought, first of all, I had something that would be really interesting and unique and also something that I could break very easily um, and that I needed to really put some thought into. So this novel took six or seven years to write because I s stepped back from the first 10,000 words and just thought about what I had written I had an ending at that point. I knew more or less what the ending might be, but I was still afraid I didn't have the right skill set as a writer to pull it off, um, to keep the focus on that relationship, even while you have. And so I kept thinking to my, in myself, even though it's a flawed analogy, that what I had was the possibility of a Godzilla versus Mothra thing happening in the background and a Chekhov play in the foreground <laughs> um, and, and, and pulling that off. You know, how do you pull off the intimacy of the one thing versus the epic? of the other. Uh, and along the way, you read fiction that reminds you. I mean, there was fiction I, I read that, re that showed me how I might not want to do it. Um, and then there was fiction like Colson Whitehead Zone 1 with great interiority of character and an epic focus that told me, oh, this is an interesting blueprint, some of the technique in this. And so gradually, then I worked my way up to, to writing the novel. But then there were all these moments of discovery uh, from like 2015 until I finished the novel uh, that I didn't, didn't expect. Uh, things about Wick, things about um, uh, Rachel, the way Bourne behaves. Bourne at certain points uh, kind of, I'd lost control of him in a good way. Um, he 
you did things I didn't expect. And, and that's kind of a cop out because there are always things you came up with. But you kind of s begin to see characters as separate uh, from yourself and, and doing things. Um, and one of, the biggest, one of the biggest problems I had was actually cutting back on the dialogue between <laughs> Rachel and Bourne um, because I had so much more of it uh, in the rough draft and it, and it was actually kind of clogging up the ar arteries of the story. Um, but, I, but I have done what, what you did with, with uh, the mall one, which is that you know, I had a novel that was set, I knew it was going to be set over seven days of a murder case, more or less. And so that gave me the scaffolding. So I kind of built an outline around that, and it made organic sense because, there were, again, like you said, all these things I could string off of that. Um, yeah, so you sneak into this book. First of all, there's a lot about language in the book, which you read some of it. Born is learning how to speak. Then, then Born starts speaking in these funny, archaic ways, which are hilarious. Uh, and you have a great sense of humor. Um, but about three quarters of the way through the book, I realized, oh, there's a meta thing going on here, which I stupidly missed, which is, of course, I'm reading a book, and there's all these books that are creating Bourne's reality or sense of what reality could be or what he, he, what, very sexist of you to call him a he, but you do call him a he in the book. That's Rachel's um, assumption, yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Bourne's diary refu refutes it, yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, were you thinking like that? Are you thinking, oh, I'll do this trick where I'll, it'll be a, it's a book and it'll be, a, there'll be all these books in my book. I was just, I was mostly, to be absolutely honest, just thinking that um, in this devastated future, there, there really wouldn't be any internet or anything else that could be used, so it would just be the abandoned books that 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 Born can find or Rachel can find uh, for Born. Um, but I didn't I didn't necessarily think of anything meta. But then the other thing is that in both this book and in the Southern Reach, I feel like uh, I was trying to leave more space for the reader's imagination to bring things into it. So I, I can't, you know, I haven't done the debrief or the, the, the reverse engineering on Born yet. Usually about a year or two afterwards, I'll go back and look at all the reader comments and the reviews and I'll say, what is it in here that, that I created that I didn't realize I created? Um, and because it's useful for thinking about the next thing. Um, because then you become intentional about something you were not necessarily intentional about before and it's a different effect. I was saying be, before when we were first talking this evening that uh, Ian McEwen describes his all the work that he's written as one long project, and everything is lead, one thing is leading to the next thing and brings up questions that you you weren't thinking about. Okay, so the 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 thing that really sits behind everything in this and in your other piece is the gap between the human sentient mentality and its attempt to understand another mentality, which, I mean, you can just take to extreme point and say it can be the gap between us. Just, I mean, right, right. I, I, the easy one for me to go to is male, okay, I'm gonna get killed for this, but anyway, male thinking versus female thinking, uh, trying to understand. <laughs> but I think there is different ways of thinking. Um, and uh, the, what I loved about the first book, and it comes up in this book as well, is that more and more, I don't know about other people, but I'm thinking about consciousness that isn't human, that isn't, you know, we live in this anthrocentric world where everything's very important if we think it's important. Very important to save the tigers, because we find tigers wonderful. Yeah, yeah. But we don't care so much about how many viruses we kill on any given day when we take a, 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 some medicine or something, mm -hmm. because we don't relate to viruses. Right, so we, we create a value judgment that has nothing to do with um, the functionality of things in the world, more or less. Um, and yeah, that's something I definitely push back against. And when I write about animals, I want them to be animals. I don't th want them to be stand-ins for kinds of humans. I think that uh, there's also a very uh, non-rich, horrifying tradition in science fiction of, of aliens and animals standing in for other things in ways that are problematic. 
Um, so I really, when I, when I write something that's alien, when I write something that uh, is animal-like, uh, if there is anthropomorphizing going on, it's, it's simply because there's a character that's projecting something onto the animal in the text. But for the most part, I am trying in the details to create an idea of what it would be like for example, with Bourne, uh, I get the sense that Bourne's brain is dis is distributed like a squid's is distributed, like a squid has neurons in its tentacles. Um, and so you begin to think of, um, well, how does that make the, that that creature's experience different? You know, in terms of how it thinks. You know, because you know even dolphins, the way that they think is in part predicated by the fact that that uh, not just the communication, but the fact that they're moving through water and that part of their communication is, is how they move through water, um, which is even leading to really interesting stuff in media theory now, um, you know, in terms of how animals communicate. Um, but all of this is not just about empathy, but it's also about the fact that we don't really totally understand the world that's, that's around us now. Um, and the more that we can understand that world, um, the more maybe we can understand that there's all this connectivity that we're breaking um, that is so important to saving the world, so to speak, beyond even global warming, um, beyond you know, the, 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 the fact that we s so often move against the way the world works um, with our technology and everything else. Um, and, and also, I, you know, I, I, I push back against sentimentality with regard to animals um, uh, in fiction. Um, and, and, and weird things that happen, like uh, there was a picture of an of a, of a otter in a cage with a little circle in the cage, a, a little hole, so that people could shake hands with it. And there were so many people sharing this as if this was the cutest thing in the world, when in fact this was just about a caged animal that was being forced to shake hands with you. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, that, that's a lack of empathy that bothers me quite a bit, um, because it speaks to lack of empathy in other ways, too. Yeah, I, uh, I don't own a pet, but... You don't? No. I, I, not in the city. I, I have a whole other... Oh, you have theme. a pet I bear, can, though, don't you? And didn't you say in... Well, I have a bear yeah. in my uh, yard up in northern New Jersey uh, who I, is very interesting to be around a real bear. Uh, who's being a bear, just doing bear things. Not flying. But uh, <laughs> I have, um, but, you know, I'm close to some of my friends' pets and uh, dogs and cats and my mother's cat. And that, that gap that exists where you're looking in their eyes, you're totally, fully aware of consciousness, but there's no language there. Obviously, there's no way to talk really in a, in a detailed way. And that's what, what's happening all the way through this book is there's a lot of, and, and, and your, like you said, I love that part about she, capture, she catches Bourne reading with this little light coming down over his head, but he doesn't actually need the light. He's just doing that because he thinks that that's what she needs him. You know? So Bourne is trying to understand what does she want from him. It's it, it, the, the whole, you, you, you keep meditating throughout reading the book of this gap between these two uh, consciousnesses that are trying to find each other. And I guess they end up talking about love a lot. Well, and one of the tragedies is that um, as Bourne reaches his full potential, whatever that is, he's still, a, he's still very much in the early stages of development. He doesn't have time to even explore the, the, the powers that he does have. He doesn't really understand all of the extra senses that he has. Um, he has to communicate with Rachel in very basic um, vocabulary. So there were definitely um, scenes where they're talking where I wanted it to seem like a very basic conversation, but I also wanted it to be that Bourne was trying to communicate something much more complex and urgent in terms of Bourne's point of view um, underneath that. Um, so so th there was a trick, too, to, to making those conversations seem childlike, but they're not really. And at one point, I also thought about having Bourne's diary entries that she eventually finds being much more, um, you know, uh, uh, much more of it on the page. But then I realized that the rest of it probably is stuff that she wouldn't understand or, and, and that the reader wouldn't understand. It would, might not even be in a language that, you know, um, it, it wouldn't even appear like language, potentially. Um, but yeah. So I work uh, very closely with my wife, and you seem to work with your wife. So that's interesting to me. What do you guys do? Do you read out loud? Uh, do you? Uh, is there an editing process? Or well, I mean, I say Anne. 
Well, well, well here, here's, here's one thing. Um, I can't show um, rough draft material to anyone except for Anne. If I do, I get blocked and I can't write that thing. I learned very early on because I had several things that I started and I would show people and then I would never write them. Um, and so Anne's the only person I can show my stuff. And then also, she's the only one that I can actually talk about scenes I haven't written yet. So a lot of times in, in this book and in the Southern Reach, I would reach some kind of like knot in the narrative. And I would be concerned that I didn't have something quite right about the character or whatever. Uh, and, and I would come to Anne and we would, we would uh, stand on the stoop and I would tell her the, the issue. And she would have some kind of solution or some kind of question that would knock something free. And, and part of that is that I come from what I would call almost a kind of sub-nuclear family. And Anne comes from a very extended family. So early on um, in my books, um, all of my characters, like their parents were gone. Um, they didn't have any siblings. Um, and it was just like the easiest way for me to like write characters, because um, it was kind of in a weird way what I, what I knew. Um, and then I, I, I came up and started living with Anne. And, you know, a second cousin would die, and it would be a major, a major emotional thing. Whereas to me, a second cousin might as well be an alien from another planet. Um, so, so that also helped quite a bit. And I think it comes to maturation inborn in terms of the way the characters are trying to connect. Um. Yeah, I, I will. I'll bring an idea to Joe, and she'll just say, "Yeah, that's interesting. Go write it, and then I'll read it." <laughs> Uh, well, she'll do that sometimes, too. <laughs> uh, so I'll leave you. My last question, I don't know if we're going to do Q&A or something. Is yeah. that coming? Okay. So my, uh, I don't know if you, you don't know my work well enough to know every, every sentence I've ever written. But in talk radio, Kent uh, is making up a story when he calls into Barry. And uh, he's this this talk show host guy, and he calls in, and he says that his parents are away on vacation, and he goes, where are they? He says, they're in, in Fiji. Yeah, Fiji. Is there a place called Fiji? So tell me about Fiji. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about Fiji. I just threw it well, in there. Well, it is, it is the proverbial um, tropical paradise, although not without out its issues, because there are certain conflicts going How on there. Uh, I was there for like five years. My parents were in the Peace Corps. Uh, my dad taught at the University of the South Pacific, and my mom was a biological illustrator before computers took that job away from, from people. And, uh, and so she was drawing sea turtles and other things for various naturalists. And uh, yeah, it was basically a tropical paradise, and uh, I was very embedded with all kinds of nature. And, um, and for the longest time, I couldn't write about Fiji. Um, I, I, I tried and tried, and I think it was because I was in that in-between place. I, I wasn't a citizen. I wasn't embedded. I was just there for a while. I was more than a tourist, but I still felt some reluctance to dealing with it head on because I didn't feel almost like I had the experience to. And I was also young at the time. Um, and so finally, in, in Born and some other work, certain scenes are evocative of things that I remember uh, from Fiji. But it's still just kind of around the edges um, in a way that I think works for me. I don't think I'll ever write about it directly. But it was, it was definitely a formative uh, thing. And also the fact that my parents, instead of taking um, raises, they, they uh, took travel vouchers. And so what that meant is that when we came back from Fiji, we traveled around the world for nine months at the age of nine, and that was an amazing experience, you know. Wow. Um, so. It totally enriches your work, and I think I'm done with my portion of the uh, program, and now we go to q and A. time for some questions? Absolutely. Okay. Just raise your hand if you don't mind. So I read a short novel of yours called, I believe, The Situation, and it had a character that became a bear. And I was wondering, you said that you started writing Born about 10 years ago, and I don't know when you wrote the situation, I don't remember, but how do they relate to each other? And did you create the situation? Did you write it as a way of working out some things in Born, or were they totally unrelated? Or am I just making all of this up? <laughs> no, sometimes, sometimes, as with the prior uh, series, Am the Ambergris series, uh, way back when, um, there'll be like a proto story. There'll be a story that has characters that turn out in later stories to have nothing to do with one another, but they take the same form or they have the same name, which I know is a little weird, but it's almost like in a laboratory of, of sorts, you're, you're, 
you're coming to grip with some kind of proto version of things. And so there are some proto versions in there, including a, a bear uh, that used to be a person who begins to fly. But, but that was a workplace satire. And so it has a totally different tone and totally different texture. Uh, and, but you're not, you're not wrong about that. Um, and in fact, there's another story called The Third Bear that uh, features a kind of displaced, uh, moored proxy uh, in it. So, so I've been writing about bears a lot. Uh, my agent has told me that since Born has been optioned by Paramount that I need to stop writing about bears because <laughs> technically Paramount then owns every bear I write. But <laughs> so they're all marmots now. <laughs> or bear-like. <laughs> You know, I, I grew up in a, a little bit in the tropics, so I always feel like there's this thing of um, nature always coming back and taking over no matter what happens. And uh, your book stayed with me for a very long time. Like, it was like months later, I, I was like, oh, thanks. <gasps> you know. Thanks, um, thanks. The question, the thing I want to ask is your characterizations, your, the, your, your characters, that, that there's so much depth to them. I mean, even reading uh, your women, you know, you, as a woman reading that, I could recognize female things. I mean, where the hell does that come from? And yes, there is that separation between <laughs> <laughs> male and female mind. I know I gasp, but honestly, it's true. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's something that I kind of um, went into slowly. Um, I, I recognized that I wanted to write more women characters, but I wanted, I didn't, I wanted, I, didn't want to do it half-assed. Um, and, and, and early on, when you're trying to master all kinds of different things, um, I, would pro I think I had fewer women characters. I had more characters that were kind of like reflections of myself. Um, but um, you know, starting with Shriek and Afterward, which is narrated uh, uh, by a sister and a brother, um, uh, I started to, to do that. And then when Annihilation came around, uh, you know, they didn't have names. And I immediately thought, they're all women. And, and, and then I was like, are they all women? And then the very next day after I slept on it, I had all of their particulars in my head. Uh, and for me, at least, it's just um, following the, the particulars of the particular person. Um, and then sometimes, to be honest, um, you know, it's, it's your first readers who correct something or give you some insight into it. Um, in a novel called Finch, uh, I had a, a, a woman character that I clearly didn't, get, didn't have a handle on at all. And I had a first reader who was a woman who was able to identify exactly why. And, uh, and I was able to, to fix that. And then I have, like I said, a lot of conversations with Anne. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I just, um, I just I, I gravitate more towards those stories. The next novel also has a woman main character. It's a, a woman who's a former bodybuilder who's in her late 40s and is a software manager. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, I, I haven't, there haven't been many compelling male characters that I've wanted to write about lately. Well, you write so. them very distinctive yeah. because all oh. of those women, I, you kept it all the way through. Oh, there well, was no I really, really, really appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, so I, I have to interrupt here. So, bodybuilders, Harry Cruz. Do you have any connection to Harry Cruz, Florida? Well, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Um, when I went hey, to the, Harry when I went to the, no, when I, I like his work, but when I went to the University of Florida, he was kind of on his downward whatever. And so one of the reasons that I didn't get a creative writing degree is I looked over at the cluster bleep that was the creative writing department at that time and said, nah, for ethical, moral, and all kinds of reasons, mm, I think I'm going to get an English degree. Um, so, so, but I did, I do, I do, I do like some of his work. Yeah. He wrote Body, which is about body. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, that's all. Just had to, I was curious. Question? Great artist in Florida. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a question about your anthologies, actually. But I was wondering when I was reading The Weird, which was spectacular and eye-opening into so many different writers, how, when you're doing something like that, do you balance historically important stories and stories that you just really like when you're deciding what to include? Well, that's the hilarious thing, because um, every once in a while you'll have a reader who will be indignant that, they, that, that I liked a story they hated so much. And be like, well, maybe, maybe that one I didn't like that much, but it was historically important. Um, <laughs> because it really isn't supposed to be stuff Anne and I like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully it is to some degree. Um, but even with the historically important stuff, it's like, 
you go back to the other anthologies and you realize just how many power plays were made there to make certain people iconic. Or you realize that it's so much easier to get permissions to this one writer than this other writer. And one reason this one writer is in every damn anthology and then becomes iconic is partly the talent, but partly because you can get their work for like five cents on the dollar. Um, as opposed to some other writer whose agent sends you crazy ass uh, faxes back and for your request, or another estate where you're told that the woman who runs the estate is in a coma and there's no provisions for what to do if she's neither dead nor alive, and so they can't give you the permissions, or you have to send somebody that you know from a Mexican circus on a horse down the Yucatan Peninsula to get rights from Leonore Carrington. Um, so, you know, it's like. <laughs> Uh, or you have to explain to monks on an island what the internet is and that you're not pirates in the traditional sense because they own the rights. So, so you know, there's a lot of things that go in anthologies behind the scenes. And in fact, uh, our plan is once we finish being anthologists is to take our secret history of anthology making and just post it on my blog um, because there are some horror stories that no one knows about and needs to, but they can't know until after we no longer need permissions from anyone. <laughs> Um, one of the things in Born that I loved so much was the whole issue surrounding the letter, which generally brings you to the end of the novel, really, and it was such a turning point for the book. Um, um, I guess one of the things I was wondering is you, you kind of switch at that point to an, a narrative from, from Wick's perspective, which the entire book you have kind of a different voice for. Um, how was it writing that, that part? that portion of the book different from you had this female voice all the way through? Well, I deliberately thought of it as um, Rachel has read the letter and thrown it away and is kind of like recollecting it. Um, and so that made it easier than trying to create a, a totally separate voice. In fact, she says there's parts of this that I will never tell you. Um, and, and so, yeah, it was, a, it was a little bit, it was, I went back and forth on that. And, and part of the reason for the letter is there are things that I thought Wick would never say directly to anyone, that he wouldn't be able to. That he would have to have that removed. Um, but yeah, and there's parts where Rachel herself is dissociated because she suffered a trauma. And so at a certain point, she starts talking about herself in the third person, which is a way of, of, of trying to get some distance from what's happened to her. Um, and then there was also the issue of uh, Rachel um, has a, a pretty sophisticated use of vocabulary, which helped me a lot because there are times when she's more informal, but then there's times when she's wit witnessing epic events, and I think she feels a historical um, kind of need to document them properly. And so I had this also this, this, um, this task of making sure that the informal and the form more formal voice didn't clash too much. Uh, throughout, the, throughout the book. So there are a lot of tonal things and I hope I got right that only readers can, can tell me if I got them right or not. So I teach annihilation and Thank you. yes, and I can't help but notice the similarities between the biologist pool when she was from her childhood and the pool in Born. Was that intentional or? Yeah, no, it is intentional. When, I, when we moved to uh, Gainesville, Florida, we moved to a rental property that had an overgrown pool in the backyard um, that was full of herons and frogs and all kinds of things, and fish even. And I, and I became kind of an amateur biologist of this space. And so I put that into Annihilation as a way of, of you know, I really wanted everything in those three books to, that was of the natural world to be something I had experienced firsthand. Um, and then when it came to Wick, it's kind of like the disgusting, weird version of that, that swimming pool. So yes, it probably will pop up again, um, just like the starfish keeps popping up, because that's something that, that happened to me. So. Questions in the back Crawler at never all? happened to me. Um, thanks. I, uh, I, I confess I haven't finished reading Born. I, what? Yeah. I, I, just, I bought it at the airport the other day, and I bought another copy today. No, but, Thank you um, for reading the, the, Yeah. The, uh, but the question I, I wanted to ask, maybe this, because I haven't finished reading Born, this is more about the Southern Reach trilogy, but there, um, something that comes up in that and that from Eric's observation with the NSA like invasion into into our, our life was like something you write about a lot uh, is how character humans deal with Invasive things like how, like uh, I mean, this, this is basically all of annihilation, and um, and I, I I wondered if maybe the, the um, 
like the technological invasion that happens both in the southern reach and what sounds like in Bourne, um, do, do you view that as a writer in a biological way? I mean, even though even though the, the technological disruption is very violent to the humans involved, um, do, do, you, do you see that as a, I mean, do you make a value judgment uh, about, like if you were writing a story, or if you were writing about a marmot, you wouldn't make I a, am writing about a marmot. Well, you wouldn't make a value judgment about the, the marmot, but it, I, maybe my question is... Well, this particular marmot is a French talking marmot, so I don't know what that means. But, <laughs> um, but to your question, which I, what, I, what I think your question is, um, uh, um, <laughs> what was I going to say? Uh, maybe one answer to your question is that as... As I've become more observant of my surroundings in decaying North Florida, I've seen that there is less of a distinction between inside and outside, and um, this idea that 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 we are this discrete body that is discrete from other things is, seems like kind of a lie. It seems like a biological lie because of our microbes and the sense, the smells we give off and the, 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 the smells we receive. We were actually talking about this at another event where, where they were saying there's more and more evidence that um, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of relationships occur just because um, the t different types of sweat are compatible between the two people. And I was saying, well, that's, that, that's something that's quite interesting, although I don't really know in terms of agency how, how useful that is to me because I can't really write a story about this sweat caused this relationship to occur and then the sweat was gone and they divorced. Uh, but, 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 <laughs> but, but, but getting to your point about technology too, you know, I, I did see uh, a lot of um, what you're talking about when I, when I had a day job, when I worked for state agencies as a contractor. Um, and you get a very, uh, both a cynical and eye-opening view about uh, corruption. <laughs> and I mean like actual corruption, not like monetary corruption, but like, like corruption of systems, um, uh, absurdity of systems, um, and breakdown of systems. And you begin to get some sense that on, to some degree the world runs on inefficiency and breakdown and, <laughs> and that it's a, a feature, not a bug. <laughs> and that if you took it away, that, that maybe things wouldn't actually run, which is a really scary thought. Uh, We've got time for one more question. Make right. it a good one. Uh, so you mentioned that your, a lot of your early work uh, was about people who didn't have families or anything. When you went to go do Shriek, was that like a really conscious decision to make it about siblings, or did it just kind of fall out of the story you wanted to tell? Um, it was kind of a corrective on... Um, something by Nabokov and then uh, an extension of experiment by a writer named Richard Grant in terms of that structure of like two, two people telling the same story more or less with one interjecting on the other person's narrative. Um, but, uh, but to some degree, um, I like the idea of quarreling siblings. And so I took certain elements of my um, relationship with my sister and amplified them and distorted them and, and did things like that. Um, and um, that felt kind of natural in terms of like a dysfunctional family. I mean, when I was in Fiji, the other thing that was happening besides Tropical Paradise was what I call the 10-year divorce. Um, and so I put a lot of that stuff about dysfunctional family politics into that story. Um, so that, that was really the only extended family kind of um, story I could tell, um, which is a very limiting one after a while. Fun note to end on. <laughs> Please, one last question. <laughs> you, you had a question, okay. <laughs> um, I was just wondering about those fantastical fox-like creatures. Oh, yes, yes. Um, it, they really struck me, you know, and you wrote them as they followed around Bourne, mm -hmm. and they were congregating around uh, Rachel, and it was implied that they had manipulated things within the story. So I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about them. I was fascinated by the idea, and I got this idea from a writer, Williams. I can't remember her first name now. Uh, she had a short... What? Joy Williams, because she's so great about animals. Um, they're always in the background of the scenes, but they're like an actor who's not, doesn't have lines in the scene, but they're still acting. They're not just standing there. Um, so she's always aware of them, right? She's in, in what they're doing. And so I thought, well, it would be really interesting if there was another narrative occurring in this novel that involved the foxes. And so there's a trace, trace elements of that, because I couldn't quite find a way to, to actually have them telling a story through all of the scenes. But there's trace elements of that. 
And I, I was so en enraptured by the foxes that I have actually written a novella called The Strange Bird, uh, which uh, the foxes play a very large role in, and you learn a lot more about them. And I also wrote a, a bestiary that FSG is going to put online soon that includes an entry on the foxes. And I like the foxes so much that the foxes' entry in the bestiary is about five times longer than any of the other entries. <laughs> so there'll be plenty for those of the, those of you who thought the story was all about the foxes and that's all you wanted. <laughs> You will get a lot more of the foxes. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. And thank you, thank you so much, Eric, You're for welcome. being here. It's an honor. Thank you both. Thank you.